I read a book uh, all about a month ago. It was called Unseen Enemy, and it was all about viruses and flus and epidemic, things like that. It was actually quite terrifying. And, uh, you know, for centuries, doctors didn't bother washing their hands uh, because they didn't really think about it. And then about 150 years ago, when they started with microscopes, they could see these tiny little particles. And then they started getting serious about, wait a minute, maybe we should wash our hands once they could see these germs under a microscope. You know, the Bible was way out ahead of this, uh, clear back, clear back thousands of years ago in the Old Testament. Uh, we've got all these rules for these ceremonial rules for washing your hands at the temple. And, and these were ceremonial. They're, they were more about, um, you know, just purifying yourself before you go to the temple. Yet, the principle is that clean hands are a virtue. And so, you know, the Bible was ahead of this. For the first month of this current coronavirus situation, everybody was washing their hands two dozen times a day, people were careful, they were kind of in, in, this, in this a little bit of a anxiety because you couldn't see the germs and you didn't know where the coronavirus was because it's this unseen enemy. And now here we are over a month into this and I, I'm, I'm just getting the sense from the people I'm talking to is they're getting tired of it. They're not as careful as they were a month ago. And I think it's for the same reason. It's an unseen enemy. We can't see it out there. It's out of sight, out of mind, and, and people aren't as worried anymore. You know, there is an unseen spiritual enemy out there. And, and we can't see it. It is just as real as this coronavirus thing. Today we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6. We're, get, we're starting a series on putting on the whole armor of God. And there is an unseen spiritual enemy, and we need to put on our protective equipment to deal with this, just like when you go to the store and people are wearing a mask. Same principle. You need to protect yourself. Welcome to Sweet Home Evangelical Church Online. I'm Pastor Brian. I'm here in the sanctuary at the Sweet Home Evangelical Church. And, uh, you know, it is, it is Sunday morning. I'm glad you're watching here. And uh, I appreciate others that are watching, too. Uh, I, I've gotten notes from people, and uh, I, people in Iowa are watching. Uh, a friend of mine from college, Jeff, has been watching Sunday mornings. And uh, so... Everybody say welcome to Jeff, okay? He's been watching uh, here sweet, at Sweet Home Evangelical Church. And Donna Lennon is in the back saying hi, Jeff. Um, and, and I just want to say thank you for sticking with us. Uh, thank you for supporting your church. Uh, you, you, you know, even though we can't get together, we're still the church. And thanks for supporting your church. Thank you for putting up with this. Uh, I, every church is online now. Some of these churches, they have got such huge production value. I mean, seriously, did they hire Steven Spielberg to <laughs> direct and produce their church service? It's amazing. And uh, here we are. All I've got is an iPhone and a Bible, but that seems to be good enough. And so thank you for sticking with us. And thanks for watching. I got Donna back today. She was she was she took last week off, and uh, so she's back today. Donna's going to lead us in, in just some music to get us in in the kind of in the zone to to get ready to hear from God, and uh, and then I'll have a message, and then she'll come back afterwards, and, and we'll have some more worship. But let me have a word of prayer for you, dear Lord. We thank you that you are the Almighty God. Lord, we thank you that we can worship you. Lord, we thank you that uh, even though all of this chaos is going on in the world, you still love us and you're still with us. And Lord, I pray that you would bless everyone who's, who's watching, everyone who's listening, wherever they're watching, whenever they're watching or listening, that your Holy Spirit would be with them, that you would speak and that your will would be done. We pray in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. All right. This song is called 10,000 Reasons. That's awesome having Donna here. Uh, let's see, I'm going to rearrange the furniture a little bit so you get to see this happen in real time on the video. Okay. I, and I got my mic on here, so I think I'm ready to go here. 
Uh, right now, you're watching this from your home. Now, I, I think you, not all of you, but some of you are getting a little too used to doing church in your lazy boy wearing your pajamas, okay? So this is going to be a bit of a shock when we do get back in the building, but uh, some of you are, are enjoying this, you know, and, and kind of we're, we're, we're creating uh, new habits here. Uh, but, you know, we're all in, in sort of a lockdown, but not really. Uh, the Apostle Paul, he was in real lockdown. I mean, he was in real, actual lockdown when he wrote the book of Ephesians. This little book in the New Testament, it is one of, of what are called the prison epistles. It has this catchy name, prison epistles, because Paul was in prison when he wrote them, okay? And just because Paul was in literal lockdown, it didn't stop him from sharing the gospel message. Uh, we're going to look at a small portion of, of chapter 6 of Ephesians. We're going to be in this for the next several weeks. And, and the whole book is good, but we're just going to look at a, at a few verses here. Ephesians 6, starting with verse 10. Paul is locked away, yet he's busy writing part of the Bible. And he is. this is not a nice, happy jail, okay? It is a difficult time, yet he is writing this letter to encourage the church specifically the church in Ephesus, but, but more generally the, the church today. That includes me and you. And, and before I read these few verses, Paul's going to write about an unseen enemy. And I, I've heard the president use this term unseen enemy in his press briefings that just, you know, that's taken up a lot of time on the news. But uh, we're not talking about the coronavirus today. Uh, you know, that's germs and viruses that you can't see unless you have a microscope. Paul is talking about a, a spiritual situation. And just like the coronavirus, though, even though you can't see it, it's just as real. And he says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor, so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Okay, Paul is writing from prison. Now, I've been a pastor for a while. I have visited uh, jail several times. And, you know, whenever I go to jail, uh, it's not a happy place. People are not having fun in there. It is, it is not a happy place. And, and Paul is the one who's in jail, yet he is telling other people, to be strong. He's encouraging the church and he's saying, hey, hang in there, folks. Be strong. Right now, we're all trying to be strong. I know a lot of you are tired of being a part of a historic worldwide event, but uh, you know this whole thing is just wearing on you. Yet, then you've got Pastor Brian coming along telling you that the Bible says that you need to be strong and you're, you're just kind of shaking your head a little bit at me. It just seems a little too much, and I get it. My physical strength, not quite what it was 20 or 30 years ago. During this whole crisis, my mental and emotional strength, it's getting a little strained. I don't know about you, but it's getting a little strained and stretched. And just because someone comes along and tells you, hey, be strong, or even because the Bible says, be strong, that, that still doesn't make you strong, does it? Uh, and, and what does the Bible say? What does Paul say here? He says, be strong in the Lord. That reminds me of, of a song that I learned, one of those earliest songs I learned as a kid in church. Jesus loves me, this I know, 
for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Now, we think that this song is a song for children, right? Because little ones to him belong, they are weak. Yeah, we think it's a song for children. So we want children to sing this. It's really cute when we have kids sing this in church. But it's a song for all of us. We are the ones who are weak, and God is strong. And yes, Jesus loves me because the Bible tells me so. Here in Ephesians, we're told to be strong in the Lord. We aren't supposed to be strong like God because, well, God is God and we aren't. But we can be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. That's what it says here. It's not our strength, it's His strength, which is such good news because I am weak, but He is strong. And my strength, wearing out, wearing down, yet here is Paul sitting in, in prison, and he is encouraging us to be strong in the Lord. And then he tells us, here's how you do that. And he says that we are to, to put on the armor of God. Paul uses this metaphor of armor. We're going to talk about armor in the coming weeks, and we'll just... We'll, we'll drag out this whole series here, and we'll look at each piece of armor each week and what that means for us. But here's Paul. He is sitting in a Roman prison, and he has Roman soldiers around him, so he's thinking about armor. And here's what the Roman soldiers have. Now, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you are not surrounded by Roman soldiers right now. However, on the news, you hear the term PPE, right? Now, Mark, right now, Mark and Millie, they know exactly what I'm talking about. By the way, Mark and Millie, they tell me that they're watching, they plug the, the computer into their TV, and they're watching me on the big screen TV, which I think is a huge mistake, because I think I look better the further away I am and the smaller the picture. But whatever you want to do, that's fine, I guess. But Mark and Millie know what I mean when I say PPE. That is personal protective equipment, right? I've made, uh, I've made hundreds of hospital visits over the years being a pastor, and uh, occasionally somebody is in rough shape, and so they, they, you know, I've had a few times where I've had to put on all of the PPE before I can go into their room and make a visit with them, and so I have to put on this, this kind of this, I don't know, it's not really paper, but it's not quite fabric either. It's somewhere in between, and this yellow thing, it's kind of like a bathrobe. You put on backwards and tie it behind you, and then you put the gloves on, and then you put a mask on so that you can, you know, steam up your glasses and not be able to see. It's great, and, uh, and, and the Bible tells us that, uh, you know, be, well, you need to have your personal protective equipment on. These days, because of the virus, people are wearing a mask and some people are wearing gloves. And this isn't exactly armor, but the purpose is to keep us from getting sick or to keep you from getting someone else sick, right? And, and it keeps you safe from the unseen enemy of a virus. And that's why, and that's the same reason we're supposed to put on the armor of God. It keeps you safe from the unseen enemy. The Bible tells us to put on the armor of God so that we can stand firm against the strategies of the devil. That sounds awesome. We're going to stand firm against the strategies of the devil. That sounds awesome. What in the world does that mean, though? Okay, what does it mean? What are the strategies of the devil? In the Gospel of John, one time Jesus is talking to his disciples, and I think it's John chapter 10, and Jesus says, he says, I am the good shepherd. Shepherd, that's a term that we see in the Bible, loads of, of meaning packed into this, this word shepherd. It's, it's, you see this all through the scriptures. Uh, clear back that, that most famous of Psalms, the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my what? Shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. And here Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. 
He is the one who cares for us and protects us and leads us. And in this passage, in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Oh, that's kind of nice. And then it, then it takes a strange turn, and it talks about how there's also somebody else out there, someone who is, has come to steal and kill and destroy. Well, that sounds like a bad guy. And, and he has come to steal, kill, and destroy. And in the middle of this section where Jesus talks about the good shepherd, that means that we are the sheep, Right? And so the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And we're not talking about farm animals here. That's talking about us. That's a little bit terrifying now when you think about it. He's, he's coming after those of us who can say, the Lord is my shepherd. That's his purpose, to steal, kill, and destroy. But what is, what is the strategy? Paul talks about the strategies of the devil. I talked about this earlier this year. Uh, we were in Matthew chapter 4, and Jesus was tempted by the devil. The temptations were the same for Jesus, that the same temptations that came to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, clear back in the beginning in the book of Genesis. Same that we face today. We see this strategy in a uh, uh, tiny little book at the end of the New Testament, 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. For the, world, uh, for the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father. Uh, the King James Version, it, it says, uh, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. And so there's these three things, these three strategies of temptation that come from the enemy. These are the areas where we are all tempted. You see, Satan doesn't have a whole lot of new tricks. He just reuses his old tricks in new ways. And these temptations happen for Adam and Eve. Uh, they happen for Jesus in the wilderness, and they happen to us today. You remember the story, clear back in the book of Genesis, you got God creates the earth, it's great, it's perfect. God creates Adam, God creates Eve, they're in the Garden of Eden. And then God says, okay, now, I've only got one rule. And it was, and, it, and the only rule was there's this one tree, don't eat from that tree. You can do anything else you want. The, there aren't ten commandments, there's only one, don't eat from that tree. And, and Satan, you know, used these, these tricks, these three, these three tricks here to, to tempt Adam and Eve. Uh, the same thing he used when Jesus was fasting and praying in the wilderness. And he had three temptations for Jesus. What's the first temptation? The first strategy is a craving for physical pleasure. Adam and Eve are in the Garden of Eden. The serpent comes to tempt them and says, hey, you're hungry. Why don't you eat from this tree? It's right here. Eat this fruit. And it's, it might be a super fruit or something like that. It's good. Yeah. You know, in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus spent a few weeks in prayer and fasting and in the wilderness. And the devil comes and the devil says, hey, you're hungry. Why don't you turn these rocks into bread? You know, this, this, this is that temptation for physical pleasure. The temptation shows up in our lives in different ways. Ultimately, it's the temptation to fulfill physical pleasure. Satan says to Adam and Eve, hey, you're hungry, eat this fruit. He says to Jesus, hey, you're hungry, turn these rocks into bread. Now, you are not going to be tempted to eat forbidden fruit or to turn rocks into bread, but you are tempted to satisfy your physical cravings. And the devil will push you and work on you to do that. And this ranges from junk food to unhealthy physical relationships to a pill that promises to take away the pain at least for a while. That's the first strategy, this craving for physical pleasure. The second one is this craving for everything we see. 
Uh, like in the King James, it says, the lust of the eyes, uh, craving for everything we see. Uh, the serpent comes in the garden. Adam and Eve are there. Eat this fruit. And it says, Eve saw that it looked good. In the New Testament, uh, Satan comes to tempt Jesus with this second temptation. And he, and he takes him to the temple in Jerusalem and he says, hey, why don't you jump off the top of the temple and then have some angels come and they'll save you from smashing to the ground and then everybody will see you and you will look good and it will be awesome. Just do this miracle and you'll look good in front of people. I, and and Satan, Satan says, you know, just, just do this, just do this, and you'll look good. With Adam and Eve, uh, Satan said this forbidden fruit, hey, it's not just good to eat, but it also looks good. And here Satan's trying to get Jesus to do something so that he looks good. We, we are in this Instagram age where we're always trying to look good. I mean, I, I work hard at trying to place the, the camera here uh, for recording this just so I look, well, not bad. Okay, so, you know, we'll do what we can here, but I'm trying to get it just right and so that we can get the lighting right. And that's what we do in this Instagram age. We're trying to look good. And, and that's what Satan tempts us to do, is to, to something that looks good or make us look good. And then the third temptation is a pride in accomplishments and possessions. What is this pride in accomplishments and possessions? It's, it says in Matthew chapter 4, Next the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, and Satan says, I will give it to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. Satan is offering Jesus power and position, isn't he? With Adam and Eve, the devil's third temptation was to tell them, if you eat this forbidden fruit, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. You will, you will be awesome. You will get this better position. You won't be just a lowly human. You will be like God. Here Satan offers Jesus the kingdoms of the earth. He's always offering his help so that you can have possessions and accomplishments. You, you see this when you look at celebrities who have kind of walked away from their faith that they had growing up, and, and they, in a way, sold their soul in order to achieve fame and fortune. Here in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul reminds us that we are fighting against an unseen enemy that is vastly more dangerous than the coronavirus or any other virus. When I was a teenager, I had a poster on my wall in my room. Probably got it from church or something like that. But it, it looked cool, and it was kind of dark, dark, really dark blue, and, and uh, there was a sword on it and this medieval knight's helmet on there, and you got the sword and the helmet, and it looked cool. And then there's, then there's a Bible verse on there, too. And it's this verse from Ephesians chapter 6 that says, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities in this unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, against evil spirits in heavenly places. There is an unseen enemy in this world. Now, I'm not saying that there is a demon in your closet right now, okay? But when you are trying to follow God, there is an enemy out there playing defense trying to keep you from following God. I, I've been involved a couple times in some spiritual warfare things, and uh, just last week I got involved and pulled into some stuff, and I hear some strange stories that, that of of what is going on. I am not like Ghostbusters or anything. My experience is so limited. So I'm, I'm fairly sure that, that those kinds of 
experiences. It's the very rare occasion where there is demonic darkness and creepy stuff going on. Far more often, the devil is going to tempt you in these three ways I've talked about. Or the devil is going to even go the other direction and try to convince you he's not real. It's just some fairy tale. Don't worry about him. Just ignore what, what the pastor's talking about when he talks about this unseen enemy. It ain't no big deal, even though the pastor's actually just reading the Bible. This unseen enemy is going to come at you with temptations. And he's going to tempt you with physical pleasure. He's going to tempt you with things you can see or things that make you look good. And he's going to tempt you with pride in your own achievements and accomplishments. It says in Corinthians there where it talks about temptation, the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. God is faithful. You know, the, the, these are normal temptations. They are common to what everyone else faces. That's what it says in the scripture. These temptations are common to everybody else. Adam and Eve had these temptations. Jesus did. You and I have the same temptations. And the Bible says that you are not helpless. You don't need to live in fear of this unseen enemy out there. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. The Bible says to put on this personal, spiritual, protective equipment from God. You don't do this on your own. You use the armor of God. And the good news is he gives it to you freely. It, it comes as standard equipment when you have placed your faith in Jesus. When, when, you, when you have when you place your faith in Jesus, you've invited him into your heart, you enjoy and experience salvation, you, and you have hope in this life and the life to come, you get this armor of God. But the question is, will you put it on? Okay. For instance, just hypothetically, what would you think of a nurse? Now, this nurse, she works in a hospital, there are several people that have coronavirus and or COVID-19, whatever you want to call it. I don't know. I still don't know which one to call it. And so she's working in that part of the hospital, taking care of people with coronavirus. And yet this nurse, she doesn't wear gloves. Uh, she's not even washing her hands. She's not wearing a mask. She's not, she keeps touching her face and uh, like we've been told not to. What would you think? of a nurse like that. She's not wearing gloves, not wearing a mask, not washing her hands. Well, not only would you think that's kind of dumb, it's also against hospital rules, right? But you would fully expect her to also get sick, right? Yeah, because she's not doing anything to protect herself. In the same way, you need to intentionally put on the armor of God. We're going to go over this in detail in the coming weeks. Praise the Lord that we can have this spiritual protective equipment that is just freely given to us when we place our faith in him. It says the rest of, the, rest of this passage here in, in uh, Ephesians 6, Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth, the body armor or the breastplate of righteousness for shoes put on peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet. Take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. This armor of God, it is yours. It is to help you get through this life. You see, we don't live in heaven yet. And so you are given this armor of God so that you can, you can 
follow Jesus in this world? Have you said yes to Jesus? Have you invited him into your life? Have you said, Jesus, I'm not, I'm not handling this well. I have done stuff in my life. I am not good enough to get into heaven on my own. I need you. And if you've done that, have you invited him into your life, asked him for forgiveness of your sins, but also have you intentionally put on the armor of God? Are, are you living in that? Or did you just pray some prayer years ago, hoping that maybe that's a little bit of insurance so that you can go to heaven when you die? You are to put on this armor of God so that you can not just live, but successfully follow Jesus in this life and be ready for the life to come. I'm going to pray for you, and then Donna's going to sing and lead us in some more worship. Uh, but if you haven't said yes to Jesus, do that today. He is... The salvation is offered so freely, and the armor of God is there waiting for you. Dear God, I thank you that you have given us victory over everything in this life that seeks to pull us away from you. We don't have to just say, well, it wasn't my fault, uh, and we don't have to be helpless in this world, but that you give us victory, and you give us this spiritual protective equipment so that we can follow you. Lord, I thank you for how you have blessed us. Lord, I, I pray that you would bless each one listening and watching right now, that your Holy Spirit would surround them, that they can say yes to you wherever they're at in their spiritual journey, that they can say yes to you, that they can invite you in to be their Lord and Savior, or that they can say, Lord, I am not quite living a victorious Christian life. I need to put on the armor of God. I need to make sure that I'm living this every day. Lord, we want to follow you. Bless my friends, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There you go. Nothing compares to this What a wonderful name
What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection, why should I gain from his reward, I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom Why should I gain from this reward? I cannot give an answer But this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom 